Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I want to talk today a little bit about uh, a package that I've been developing called Klepto. And basically what it does is it provides uh, a uniform uh, persistent storage to memory, disk, or database. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is you want to abstract uh, storage on a database. You want to abstract storage, whether it's on file, uh, whether it's HDF or some other backend. So you want to make it uh, easy to use, and you want to make it so it can run in parallel or across a network, uh, and uh, do things like nice, uh, have local hashing to memory, so you have fast access uh, to, to an archive behind it. Um, so first, before I actually get into that, I'd like to, sh I'm not going to go through all this code, but uh, I do have this uh, up here. It's essentially, this little bit of code is a global search of, uh, you have a cluster, an ensemble of optimizers, and what I'm going to be doing is uh, basically trying to interpolate a surface with lots and lots of, um, uh, lots and lots of minima and maxima. And uh, what I'm going to do is essentially throw optimizers at it until I find all the transition points. And I'm going to use those points to uh, interpolate a surface. And the part that's using the caching is these solvers are being thrown in parallel. And I will keep throwing solvers until I find a point. So the cache is built right here. And uh, we have a, a little memoization that holds on to the stopping points of the solvers. Uh, so like I said, I'm not, I'll, I'll just, uh, I want to talk more about the interface and just show this is possible. So this is a, something that's up on the, on the web on my git space that you can see. But I basically, um, the main point of it is here's the interpolation. And uh, what we have is a surface like this, which is a good test surface. and. Uh, uh, the gri uh function, we're going between those bounds, and I can take a, a number of very stupid solvers that uh, just try to go downhill and get stuck. And uh, you can see I run, I run this, and it does caching one, two, three, four, five times until it has two misses in a row, and that's the stop condition I was looking for when you don't find two minima in a row, then stop. You can set the stop condition to be uh, something else if you like, and you can see the, the blue are the minima, and essentially I have found a bunch of those. I found all the minima in that box. Um, and this is nice because uh, what you have is one of the failures of large kind of uh, interpolation engines or when you have a nasty unknown function and you use a gridding technique, uh, you, you, you naturally can only go to certain high dimensions and nastiness of functions because you'll miss points. But with an optimizer, an optimizer kind of um, attacks the transition points in the surface. So if you have a caching algorithm that holds on to all those transition points in, in parallel, then you can get a nice collection of data points to interpolate a surface no matter how complex. So then I did the maxima there. And what you can see is you can check that the min and the max are hit almost exactly. Uh, it's very good at finding the min and max points, and optimizers also naturally seek out transition points. So this, the critical points of the surface, the optimizer will, will find, and you actually get a very good interpolation of the surface. So that function's kind of easy. Uh, and we could do harder functions if you know this uh, Brainin's function. There's a lot of minima and maxima uh, on it, it's a very kind of uh, shallow curve, and then there's a line of minima and maxima that show up in, the, in this uh, well right here, and uh, it fi finds all of them, and finds all of them within a very high tolerance. Uh, another harder function is this one, uh, which is the Ackley function. There's 50-some minima, uh, kind of it's a sign mapped on a big well, and uh, through a gridding algorithm will absolutely fail on this. Uh, this, you know, can run a couple of optimizers in parallel, it finds all the minima, finds them within the, the specified tolerance. And, uh, and then what you can do is, if this was an expensive function, and you have all the needed interpolation points out of it, you can build a nice surrogate for it and uh, 
So, so it gives you an n-dimensional kind of uh, very accurate interpolation that we use through this caching. Now, I've run it on much larger things, so it's actually built to work across, um, across the web on a parallel distributed system on a large, uh, large cluster. And uh, the, the interface, which I'll talk about now, is, is um, basically you have a dictionary interface to, uh, to a database or to some other form of backend. So the basic interface here, this is an interface to a SQL table. And uh, it's not cached, so that means we're going to be directly using the SQL archive. Uh, I'm basically sitting on top of SQL Alchemy. And you can do things like, let's store a 1, let's store a 2, let's store the function max, let's build a lambda and store squared, and then compute this, max squared of 2 and 1, pulling directly out of the database, so that's max of squared of 2 and 1. And essentially, that uh, stores those Python objects in the database and then can compute directly from the database. So you can pass objects or functions regardless of what they are as long as you can encode them in some way. You can store them in the database and use them um, on another machine. Uh, um, so here's a directory archive. Uh, it basically doing some NumPy, and this point here is there's a number of different uh, things you could store, like ints, and then here's a NumPy ufunc. Um, and there's a lot of different ways you can work with uh, these archives. So here's uh, the NumPy fast serialization. There's compression, uh, working with uh, mem map, basically memory modes. Uh, you can do this the, the hard way, just a dump of pickle um, or or, or just this raw NumPy array. Um, uh, there's different backends, so I, I have several backends, so a few of them are, you can build a in memory, so that's a dictionary, a directory, or file. So if you, have, if you have small data, you can work directly with a single file, but if you have big data, what you'd like to do is you'd have, like to have your data split up where each entry is a different file, and then you can, uh, you can work to pull out of the different files, uh, and you get basically what you need in, in the cache and memory, and everything else stays on disk, and it'll split it up and fetch the keys for you automatically. Um, so using a cache layer, you have this local memory caching, and this works, again, with connections to database or something else on the back end. Uh, and the idea is, uh, the default is to use local memory caching. So when you start to work, you work with the memory cache, and then when you do a dump, you dump it back to the archive behind it. So in this case, I'm dumping to a file. And original works in the cache. You can check the archive by saying archive, and then dump to the archive, and then it fills up, uh, it fills up the archive in the back. And it has a full dictionary interface, keys, values, items, set default. Um, and, and here you can build a duplicate. And this duplicate is linked to the uh, the file archive, so now I have two local memory caches could potentially be on another resource that are hooked up to the file archive in the back. And I work with the local memory caches, and you can synchronize between the different caches, and you could synchronize between the file with uh, dump and load, and there's sync, which synchronizes to make uh, whatever I'm synchronizing the same, in this case, uh, to the, the archive, the file archive and the memory cache. So skip down a little bit further. It comes with a decorator interface, of course, so uh, you have the handle to uh, like an LRU cache in this case, uh, and this um, you can dump and load these archives, and if you serialize the file, it still preserves the, the handle to the archive. So you can send these caches across a network, and they can still have a connection to whatever archive backend it is, so it's very nice for porting things around in parallel computing. Um, and uh, let's see, since I have two more minutes, I'll skip. Uh, you can ignore a bunch of uh, things like you can set arguments like if it's inside of a cache, I want to ignore self, and I want to ignore any keywords. Uh, so you can do masking on a, on, um, on a uh, archive or a cache. And uh, equally as well, uh, 
Um, there's a lot of lookups you can do. So you can say look up the, look up the key and get the value and uh, one. Okay. And uh, so uh, one of the other things that's nice is uh, there's uh, validation where you can check the interface of the archive without actually sending off a result. Uh, basically, you can validate that the inputs are valid. Uh, and something like this, you can either have it throw an error or not and check the signature of a function. Uh, do rounding, which is very good for um, caching something that has several levels. So you can deep round, shallow round. And uh, I will just uh, skip to the bottom. There's lots more here. You could change the um, encoding. So I have access to all sort of different encodings that you can have for the keys. And basically what we're working on is uh, using this uh, to do asynchronous synchronization uh, or adding new backends and interpolation strategies and uh, basically working to make some of these exchange strategies simpler uh, and, and so you could add your own. Um, and the, the releases and uh, the code is at uh, UQ Foundation Klepto on GitHub. So there's short time for questions. Yeah, it's Python 2 and 3, yeah. Okay. It works both of them, yep. That's good. If not anymore, so, ah, yes, on the left. Is there support for, uh, for like, connected building? From what you described it? From what you described, it sounded much like a, like a key value store from the interface. Is, is there support for, like, hierarchical data? Yeah, so uh, the back end, um, the back end is uh, Dill's serializer, and, uh, you can store anything that Dill can pickle, which is almost every construct. Uh, and uh, so some of, the, some of the algorithms basically um, can store nested functions and work with inside of nested, uh, you, you, like I saw inside of a, uh, a class. But you can also, you saw that the archives can get passed in parallel too. So it all depends on the encoding you pick, and it depends on the, the uh, store, the, the encoding and the key st storage, the key pair, pair storage strategy. So if you use Dill, which is a little bit slower, because it ha has to store sometimes compound objects, you can store one of these caches in uh, in a SQL table archive, and if it's nested, it doesn't matter. You can still run these in parallel in a nested parallel way. Uh, however, if you're working on raw SQL with uh, minimal encoding, like a string encoding. It could be faster. If you do a hash, then it's stupid to do it in parallel because the hashes will not translate across the, the machine. So, I mean, some things won't work based on the encoding strategy. Some things won't work based on the, the, uh, st the storage strategy you pick for the keys and values. But in general, the, the functionality to do nested archives and, uh, and, and keys are, are there. Thank you again.